participants in chat. Perfect. Okay. So um, we're done with the first part of class, which is um, what I like to think of as background and foundations. Which, you know, a lot of, uh, I don't know, I mean, talking some about hardware, um, you know, disks, RAM, some, uh, you know, these types of hardware things, talking about data structures and algorithms and how all of these things are relevant to um, databases, which is really that um, you're confined uh, to the real world. And so that's the hardware that's available, available and, you know, within your price range and, and all that kind of stuff. So to a certain extent, you have to have some concept of what hardware is available and how it's used. Um, and then data structures and algorithms, um, as far as uh, there's benefits to organizing your data in very particular ways. Um, <clears throat> for the purposes of this class, we care about uh, data structures that can lead to mostly a fast search. Because usually with a database, you have some gigantic amount of data, and you want to find amongst this huge pile the things that you care about quickly. <clears throat> you can accomplish that with, uh, with the right data structure. And then as an added bonus, you can also insert to make the pile higher or delete and make the pile a little bit smaller. If you can do those things efficiently as well, all the better. Um, but it's mainly search that uh, tends to be the, the one operation that you want to do the most efficiently. Okay, now we're done with that. <clears throat> but um, now when I talk about having uh, data where there's a key, um, the idea of this key is going to be that it's the basis that you construct a data structure by. So if you're using a B plus tree, then it's the thing that you're comparing to, to break left, break right, go somewhere in between, start at a root, go down to uh, the leaves and things like this. Like what, what is the actual value that you're using to traverse the tree? That's called a key. And uh, it's a separate process. It takes a little bit of time, takes a little bit of space to create what's called an index file, which is just a file that holds this data structure. And I'm not going to repeat myself all the time, but that is how those things are hopefully playing into now, the second part of our class, uh, theory, database theory. Uh, in particular, the types of databases that we're concerned about in this class are called relational databases. A relation uh, can be thought of as a table. So a table has rows. Each row is an entry. And um, each row is comprised of some number of entries and columns, where each column um, is some dimension of the data. <clears throat> so um, ER diagrams are a picture, but they're not a doodle, okay? You can't just draw whatever you want and use this as like a mechanism of getting an idea in your head to other people. ER diagrams are not that. ER diagrams have rules. And the entire point of them is to figure out, given the data that you have, how do you construct the relations or the tables? And what should these tables keys be? The keys, again, will be used to create the data structures, to search efficiently and stuff. Um, okay. 
So that, th those are the two big reasons why we're going through this two-day experiment of talking about ER diagrams. Um, given a bunch of data um, and somebody who has an who's familiar with the data and can say things like, um, uh, this is the way that these parts of the data relate to one another. Um, a can have many of B, but B can only have exactly one of A, or this type of thing. Somebody who's familiar with the data, that might be you. You might be a consultant for somebody else who's familiar with the data, and you can ask them a, a series of questions to come up with how these relations should be defined and what the keys are. That's the whole point of this. The vocabulary of ER diagrams is fairly simple. There's entities, relationships, attributes, if you like, keyed attributes as well, and the participation constraints. The participation constraints, in my opinion, are the most important and the things that require a little bit of thought um, going through them. Uh, the participation constraints um, define uh, how different parts of data, if you think of them as sets, um, how these uh, pieces of data can relate to others. Can you have a one-to-one -one relationship, or is it a one-to-many relationship, or a many-to-many -many relationship? Um, okay. Um, okay, so now I'm mixing up some of these things. Um, on the one hand, I want to talk about ER diagrams and what they are. Um, before, I used to just talk about ER diagrams by themselves and then, in a separate lecture, talk about how they relate or how they can be um, realized in relations. This semester, I'm mixing it up a little bit. I'm combining both of these. So I'm talking about ER diagrams, but for each ER diagram, I'm looking ahead to how this will be um, used in relations, which is really the whole point of using ER diagrams. Um, I don't like these arrows. Um, I'll do that. Just make sure that they're not confused with the other arrows. OK. Uh, so basically, for this class, what we're going to be doing is using essentially the same example, employees working in departments, and going through different participation constraints, and showing how by using keys, by carefully defining which key like, uh, of these different relations, what is the key to these different relations? Be it an individual key or a composite key, um, how is it that keys can uh, constrain the relations to match with these ER diagrams. So the ER diagram, again, it's just sort of an in-between kind of step. Um, I think it's helpful. It's not necessary, but it is helpful. And so that's why we're going through it. Um, here on the screen right now is an ER diagram on top that relates employees to uh, departments that employees may or may not work in. And um, in particular, these two things. 
the way that the entities connect to the relationship is going to be the driving factor to how the relations are um, put together. For each of the entities, that is an easy thing. Um, the entity is going to be the name of the table. Each of its attributes are going to be the columns of the table. Same thing with employees. That means we'll have an employee table. The employee's entity has three attributes, social security number, name, and lot. Therefore, a resulting relation will be called employee. It will have three columns, social security number, name, and lot. And the uh, trickier part is capturing the relationship and the types of participation constraints that the entities have with this relationship. Okay, so that's what we're doing. Um, so we left off last class, that's where we'll be picking up this class. Um, yeah, just for the sake of review, let me uh, pick out on some students and uh, have you fill in the gaps from the last class. Um, what we were talking about here. How about Claire? Hello. Hello. Um, given, let's start with this participation constraint, the one that I'm circling in blue. In English, just, you know, regular English words, um, how would you describe what this participation constraint is doing or what it says or whatever? Um, that means unconstrained relationship. What is has an unconstrained relationship with what? Um, any amount of employees can work in any department. Or many to many. No, ooh, ooh, no, no, no. You can't say many to many yet. Okay. Um, hold on. So, all right. <clears throat> You're always going to have two entities um, going through a relationship. You could have more than 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 two entities. You could have three or four or five entities all connected through some relationship. Right now, we're doing it a little bit uh, simply where there's two entities that um, are connected through some relationship. Now, each of these entities will have a participation constraint, which means in order to capture this, you're going to need two complete sentences. The one that I've circled now is the way that employees relate to departments. So that, that will be one sentence that talks about how employees relate to departments. Secondary to that, so here, what I've highlighted now, there is a sentence that will start off with employees, something, something, departments. That's the, the order that the English sentence would have. Employees, something, something, two departments. Um, separate from that, you have this one, which is the way that departments, something, something, the way that departments relate to employees. So there's going to be two sort of sentences here. Um, yeah, right now I'm focused on this one. I'll make the, the English sentence here. Okay, so how would you how would you phrase that? You're right, it's unconstrained, but what does this say about employees in relation to departments? Um Is it 
um, can you even say many employees to one department? That's department. going the other way. That's talking about okay. departments. Yeah. Okay, so one employee works in many departments. One employee can work in many departments. Can an employee work in? Uh, uh, that's true. That statement is true. It's not the complete truth. An employee can work in many departments. Um, that's part of the truth. Can an employee work in, must an employee work in many departments? No. Okay, so an employee can work in one department? Yeah. Okay, can an employee work in zero departments? Yeah. Okay, so uh, if I may, um, I'll say employees, so that's my one, can work in zero, one, or many, that's the two departments. At least in my head, this is the way that I think about it. Like for, for this relationship, this one that I'm circling again and again, um, the way to describe it is to start with the, uh, with the word employees, um, and then the can work in zero, one, or many is, is, the, is the two part um, departments, three. Okay, makes sense. That makes sense. Okay, very yeah. good. Um, so just to keep you on, um, let me do this. Um, let's go the other way. How about, um, I don't know, I'll do a different color. How about this one, I don't know, that color. Okay, so how, what, what would this be in, in English? Would you start with employees or would you start with the word department? Start with the word department. Department mm -hmm. can have zero, one, or many employees. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yes, I agree. Can you see that we need two, we need both of these sentences? Um, if you only had one sentence, that there could be scenarios where you would be breaking something in another sentence. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So can you give me an example of that? The, Suppose we only had the blue sentence. Mm -hmm. um, what would be two things that could happen with the blue sentence that could break the red sentence? Actually, everything's unconstrained here, so it doesn't really work, but maybe you can think of something. Okay, we'll come back to it. We'll come back to that because yeah, this isn't this. This happens to not be a, con a concretely good example for this, but very good. Uh, do do you understand okay. anyway the participation constraints and how that corresponds to English? Yeah. That makes okay. Sense. Good. So, I mean, the reason why I'm doing this is actually I'm doing it backwards. Usually, the way that it would go is that you, the designer, or you, the consultant, or you, the boss, would be talking to somebody who's familiar with the data, and you would ask them, can an employee work in zero departments? Yes or no? Yes, okay. Can an employee work in one department? Yes, okay. Can an employee work in many departments? Yes, okay. And so, you would first be getting the English statements from somebody who doesn't know anything about ER diagrams 
right? You can just, they can in plain English explain the way that this data should work or the way that the, the rules should be. And now you, given the English statements, can construct an ER diagram. And then from that ER diagram, you can build up the relations or whatever. So this is going a little bit backwards, where I'm teaching first the ER diagrams and asking you to translate them in English. But in the real world, you would be more likely than not starting in English and then going to an ER diagram. But I think if you can go from one to the other, then you can go the other way. So that's the way I'm doing it. Beautiful. All right. Let me pick on somebody else to talk about this. Uh, um, here. All right. How about... Uh, Xinying. Xinying Xia. Mm -hmm. Hello. Hello. Am I am I saying your name right? Xinying. Yes. Great. Um, so similar thing. Um, I would like to take this relationship and or, or this participation constraint and come up with an English statement that describes it. How this. Uh, makes employees relate to departments. Um, employees can have zero, one, many in the uh, department. Uh, yeah, can uh, work in zero, one, or many departments. Very good. Okay. Um, how about this one now? The department can have at most one employee. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay. Now, here is uh, a, a time when you need both directions, right? Having one direction isn't enough, and it's difficult to combine them into one sentence. It seems to me that the best way to capture this is to have multiple declarative sentences. Now we have two, one for each entity. Um, employees can work in zero, one, or many departments, and departments can have um, at most one employee. Um, yeah, oh, be a strict grammarian. All right. <clears throat> um, so you'll notice, I sorry, that these English sentences. The first one, the the the, the one in blue, is the same. Right? Employees can work in zero, one, or many departments. Here, employees can work in zero, one, or many departments. But now the second sentence in red is different. So uh, can you give an example of something that would be OK in the second example? I'm sorry, something that would be OK in this first example when departments are unconstrained, that would violate the constraint in the second example. How about uh, John? Do we have more than one John? I don't think so. Yeah. John, do you have a mic? Sorry, you said John? Yeah. yeah. Um, something that would, so you said something that would in the first one, not in the second? Yeah. Um, maybe the social security number? 
And the social security number what? You could put it in the works in, but you couldn't put it in the department. Oh, you're getting uh, a little bit more concrete. Just in plain English. Okay. In the second example, an employee can work in zero, one, or many departments, but departments can have at most one employee, where up here, um, employees are unconstrained and department employees are unconstrained with employees relationships to departments and departments are unconstrained with their relationship to employees so what would be an example like a plain english example of something where in the first in this first one where departments are unconstrained in their relationship with employees what is something that you might see an example um, that that is okay in this first example that is not okay in the second example? Does my question make sense or no? Um, yeah, I just think it's because visually I, I can't see both of them. So, so the difference between the top one and the bottom one is that the department has to have at least one employee, but on the top, departments can have zero employees? Uh, almost. Um, departments can have any number of employees in the first one, zero, one, or many. Um, in the bottom one, uh, departments can have no employees, or they can have one employee, but they cannot have more than one employee. Hi, Professor. Um, can I take a guess at it? Sure. Um, so I think in the first um, one, it would be acceptable to have, like, you can have a, a multiple department ID. You can have, like, for example, we see that there's two employees that work in, in the works in table. They work in the same department, one, one. So that's acceptable because that department can have zero, one, or many employees. Sure. And then in the second, in the second, um, using the second example that you said, um, in the works in table, there can only be um, one employee that can have the same department ID. Yeah, very good. All right. Yeah, I think that works. So here, well, like, yeah, so here's an example. Like, here's a department, accounting, let's say. And in this, in this first example, you can have one department with multiple employees, John and Paul. They both work in accounting. That cannot happen in the second example because departments can't have two employees. So that's that's what I mean. Just like a plain English example of when this is okay in the first example, it's not okay in the second. Here, that's okay. Here, that's not okay. Right, that you can have a department with more than one employee. Okay, so that was just hopefully kind of a plain English kind of what are we talking about review. All right. Um, let me turn off this camera so I can write a bit easier. Okay. Okay, so to repeat, the entities, like here's an entity here on the left, the employee's entity, here's another entity, the department's entity, those tend to be easy to handle. You just make a table with them. Done. The hard part comes here, 
and trying to figure out what to do with the relationship and the participation constraints. In this example, when um, you have two things that are unconstrained, then you can create a new table or for the uh, relationship. The relationship can go in its own table. And the keys are a composite key, which means that um, it's the combination of social security number and department ID that have to be unique. So although, for example, in the works in table, the first and the second row both have the same social security number, that's not a problem because the key in the works in table is not just the social security number, it's the combination of social security number and department ID. So although the first two rows in the works in table here and here have the same social security number, they differ in their department ID. All right. Um, uh, the purple arrows here um, connecting the SSN here um, in the works in table to the SSN in the employee table, um, that is to indicate that um, the social security number is what's called a foreign key which means that any value in the works in table of social security number must appear somewhere in the employee table for the social security number. So for example, this three, 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 two, I don't know, 2010. This is no good because this 3333 does not appear here. Okay, so that's what the purple arrow is doing, is it's enforcing that for any uh, record, for any row that appears in one table, that value has to appear in another table. Otherwise, it's an invalid entry. Okay. Are there any questions about this? Okay. So then we talked about um, a slight modification, which is now we're just constraining one part of this relationship. The employees, still unconstrained. Um, the department is now constrained to having at most one employee. One way you can do this is to have, like up here, let me see if I can get both of these. like in the table above, um, works in is its own table, except now you change the key. Now instead of having a composite key with social security number and department ID, you have a single key, the department, which means that in the works in table, no department can appear more than one time. Because if it does, if you were to have a department appear more than once in the works in table, when the department is the key, then that enforces that every entry in this table for the column of department can have no repeats. 
So here on this third row, for example, here, I'm highlighting, if you were to try to insert that third row, you would get an error because that department already exists inside of the table. So you would get uh, an error. Um, another way you can do it, because the department is the only key that you're using in the works in table, in method one, in method two, you can combine the works in table and the department table. Because the department table already has as its single key the department ID, and the works in table is also just using the department ID as its key, then you can expand the department table. And now the department ID key of it is doing double duty. Um, it's maintaining the, the uniqueness of each department in the department table, and it's also uh, maintaining the fact that uh, no employee can work, or that no department can have uh, more than one employee. Um, so the department column of works in is not needed because the DID column in the department table is already enforcing that. And now the department table you can expand with a social security number being a foreign key. Do this too. Um, with the social security number being a foreign key into the employee table and um, adding a since column because that exists in the works in table um, and you're kind of combining the two. Okay, any questions about that? No. Wow, okay. Um, all right. Try another one. This one will be maybe a little bit easier. I don't know. Let's have a relation A and a relation B that go through some relationship R. And each of these can have exactly one. So one A can have exactly one B, and one B can have exactly one A. Um, this will have, B will have as a key, the lowercase b, A will have as a key, a lowercase a. How can I capture this? I will give you, uh, let's say, two minutes to think about it. So how could you come up with a relation to capture this? Again, A can have exactly one B, and B can have exactly one A. Um, yeah, how would, how would this look like? Um, so two minutes on my clock would be 11.05. So you got two minutes. Try to work it out and I'll call on somebody randomly.
Okay. Um, let me do my random spinning of class. Close eyes, close eyes, close eyes. What it land? Uh, Xue Yun. Oh, it just locked off. Oh, that's not. Oh boy. Uh, okay. I had no idea it had that kind of effect on people. Oh no. All right. How about? Um, <laughs> it's a really, it was a really random choice. Okay. How about uh, Unadi? Hi. Hi. Um. So many A to one R and one R to many B. Many A to one R. No. So here, think about this as two sets, A and B. Mm -hmm. And A can have certain members of the set, and B can have certain members of the set. And it's which, which of these are allowed. So for example, would this be OK? No. Why not? Mm. As long as the key is unique, or like the so, would there be a composite key in the table R? Would be a composite key in table R. So you want you want uh, okay. Um, there's a table A, a table R, and a table B. That's how you're doing this. So actually, would this work? Um, so 1A to 0 or 1R, and then the same thing on the other side, 1B to 0 or 1R. Ah, oh. so sorry, this is a thick arrow. Let me go back up here. Mm -hmm. And oh, okay. um, yeah, if, mm -hmm. if, if you don't have this written down, um, guys, take like a minute and jot this down on a sheet of paper, these at least, the, the constraints. A thin line means unconstrained. A thin arrow means at most one. A thick line is at least one. And a thick arrow is exactly one. So the thick arrow is a combination of a thin arrow at most one and a thick line at least one. If you're at most one and at least one, that means you're exactly one. Mm -hmm. So, OK. Um, right. Okay. So, so this is saying, yeah, go ahead. Exactly one. Okay, so A has exactly one R and B has exactly one R. A's don't connect to R's. A's connect to B's. B's okay. connect to A's. So here, for example, um, with the uh, employees and the departments and the working in, um, it's not employees work in and done and departments work in. No, employees are connected to departments. Employees work in departments and departments have employees that work inside of them. So in this case, A's can have exactly one B, and B's can have exactly one A. That makes sense. Um, so I guess, like, what do I have to provide? How do we capture this in a, in a table? Okay. Mm -hmm. In terms of keys? Yeah, in terms of which tables you want to define and their keys. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, if it's a one-to-one -one relationship, why do we need R? So ER diagrams work like this. Entities cannot connect directly with other entities. The mm -hmm. only way that entities can connect is through some relationship. 
Okay. Mm, I'm not quite sure. Okay. So um, let's get as far as we can until you're uh, lost. Um, is there any relation that you can think of to define? So, mm. one way in which you can never go wrong. You'll never be wrong doing this. Maybe you can be a bit more efficient, but you'll never be wrong. Have the each entity become a table. And have the relation become a table. OK? Um, so this way, you'll never be wrong. Maybe you can have fewer tables. Maybe. Um, that's, that's more of a question of efficiency than anything else. Um, but the entities tend to be easy. How do, we, how do we turn, for example, that entity into a table? Um, I mean, it would just have a primary key mm -hmm. that's unique for each record. OK, and what's the primary key? Uh, well, should I just make something up, like a uh, student ID? Oh, you don't have to make something up. I'm giving it to you here. There's there's an entity oh. named capital A. It has one it's, attribute, um, little a. Lowercase a. Yeah. Okay. Lowercase a. Um, and that's it. Okay. And what 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 do we call this table? Um, table A. Yeah, capital A. Yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, how about for table B? Uh, the key will be lowercase b, and the name will be capital A, uh, capital B. Okay, very good. All right, so so far so good. Nothing, nothing is. Uh, all this is, you know, that's 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 the easy part. Entities into tables, super straightforward. Now, uh, one can way. We do, um, hmm? Can we do uh, one to many? For A to R and many to one for R to B. One to many and many to one. I'm trying to imagine what this would look like. So you're trying to imagine three things. Actually, never Here mind. you have one mm -hmm. to many. Never mind. That would be that would create a many to many. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here um, you'll have something A. This is the um, sorry below here. This is the sort of set idea. Um, you could have this, that would be okay, right? For, a for, um, a, for each member of A, there's exactly one member of B that it is associated with, and the same for B. For every B, there is exactly one A. This here is the sort of set diagram, if we're talking about sets. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, but let's go back to here at the tables. Um, okay, so one thing that you can always do is, again, the entities to tables, that's just straightforward. Do you have any questions about that? No. Okay, so now for the relation table, we can call that R. And no matter what, it has, um, well, there's this part of it. And uh, so you need at least the, the primary key for that, for that part of the relationship. And similarly, for this part of the relationship, for each of the entities that are coming into the relationship, you need their key. Okay. Okay. So the R table is good, like this. Now the question is, what are the keys in the R table? And the keys... Remember, you want them to be uh, such that this is captured and that's captured. So that 1A can only match to exactly 1B, and 1B can only match to 1A. Let's focus on this first part. 
How would you do that, you think? Could you... Um, well, a composite key is when usually, like, you usually use that when you're trying to create a many-to-many. -many. So I'm not sure, like, what you could make the key for R. Yep, don't need a composite key. Yeah. Very good. Okay. Could you just make a the um the like the primary key and then make a foreign key to A in table B? Just to like connect it. Oh, sorry, yeah. So yes, 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 you're right. So that will be a foreign key here. So this will be a foreign key here. Very good. Okay. So do you just create like a third column C for the primary key? Let's see what that would look like. Or would that create another foreign key? That's kind of, you can't really do that. Is that okay? Now you say create a primary key C. Um, I don't think I'm violating anything here. The keys in A, the in R appear in A. Okay, same thing with B's. The C's are all unique. Um, but this 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 violates. This would have. Um, well, I could even do this. I don't know. One, two, three. Whatever. So then this would be like this. One. Two, three. I don't think I'm violating anything here if, if we have C as, as a key. But this is not what I want, right? I mean, that's a one-to-many relationship. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me give you the answer, and then you can explain it to me. Okay, this is not a composite key. You're right, it's not a composite key, but we have two keys, key A and key B. So why does this work? How can a table have two primary keys? It, it, because it can, to capture this type of relationship that's allowed in SQL. Um, yeah, uh, they they might call another. So there's one key that will be called a primary key, but there's other keys that can work like primary keys, and there's really no difference between them. It's just for I don't know uh, historical reasons or something. One happens to be called a primary key, but they all function like co-equal primary keys. Okay. Um... Okay. Okay. So let's let's um, go through. Uh, well, okay. Let's let's try this example. Um, would this be allowed? Yeah. Why would this be allowed? Actually, no, because that's one going to two entities of B. Yeah. So here, one appears two times. Okay. Um, how about? Uh, you could do um, one to two and three to four. Three to four, okay. Well, except I can't do three to four. That's no good because four doesn't appear here. Um, oh, okay. Um, yeah. Well, one to two and three to... Wait, okay. Um, one to one and two to two. One to one and two to two. Uh, yeah, let's keep, except we already have one going to two. So that's no good, that's no good. We have one, one to two, I don't know. Two to one. Two to one, very good. All right, yep, that works. Fine, okay. Are you convinced that this, that, that this works? That, that mm -hmm. you will not have more than one A connected to multiple Bs, and also that you won't have more than one B connected to multiple As? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, so yeah, that's this is this is one way of doing it. Um, you 
so I'll say this is method one, if you like. Uh, hi, Professor. I have a question. Yes. Um, so A and B here are composite keys in relationship. All right. They're not composite keys. Okay. So how does how would you differentiate composite keys from just having these two keys? So a composite key is when two keys are glued together. Here, you have two independent keys that each behave like primary keys. Yes, so I guess what I'm asking is, if I did, like if I wasn't following along and I looked at the, the table, how would I know if it's a composite or if it's a... Um, independent keys right so um i draw arrows that is a composite key if in addition okay. to the underline I, I i make some kind of arrow connecting the two um, so that would be <laughs> if they were composite then you could have one two and one three but yes we're looking for them to be just in, individually mapped i guess okay yes great mm -hmm. thank you yep very good yep exactly yeah so for this particular example, um, there's a method too. If you wanted, you could just have one table, call it A, B. And there's A and B, and that's it. So this way you don't actually need to have a separate A table and a separate B table. Really just the R table is, is enough by itself. Um, in, this, in this case, right? I mean, when, when you have this one-to-one, -one, uh, relationship. Um, I, I mean, again, it doesn't really matter. Like, whichever way works is good enough. Um, in this class, I'm not going any way you give that works, I'm okay with. Um, for this part, I don't care about efficiency. Um, but, you know, to, for the sake of completeness, I might give multiple options. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to take the last five minutes of class um, to give an example of something. All right, so what, what, what we're working on now is um, taking ER diagrams and translating them into a relation or into relations. Um, at the end of class, I'm going to give an example of something that works with an ER diagram. But there is no relations that you can have to realize it. That's a good exam question, I think. What's something that you can do in an ER diagram that you cannot do with relations? Um, so I'll give an example of that, and I'd like you guys to try it. Try to figure out how it might maybe work. I'm telling you it won't. Um, ahead of time, but, you know, the way that you can realize that is by trying to make it work and then figuring out where something goes wrong. So um, I'll, I'll leave that um, for the last five minutes of class just to go over. <sighs> okay. Um, Yeah, uh, in, uh, in particular, so just, just to give you sort of a heads up, and one thing which I'm skipping past, is this um, having at least one. You can capture having an unconstrained relationship, fine. 
You can capture having at most one, fine. Exactly one, fine. Having at least one, uh, there's not that mechanism in SQL or in relations. Um, now, in, in more modern, that's a half truth, in more modern types of SQL, they have extra extensions that allow you to do things like this. Here, for this part of the class, we're talking about um, translating participation constraints into key constraints. So a key constraint is the way, how are you defining your keys and which entries are okay given those keys and some entries are not okay given those keys. So that's called a key constraint. And the having at least one is something that you cannot capture with key constraints. Depending on which version of SQL you're using, they have another sort of library of constraints that you can use to do these things. Um, but as far as being able to capture that using key constraints by just carefully defining which relations you have and what the keys are, that's not something you can capture. So I'll give you an example of something to try to work through with some extra credit or something, if you can figure out like a good argument. Um, yeah, I don't know, I'll give you an extra point, extra credit or something on your final grade. Which, by the way, there was some other thing that I said this about some earlier point in class, and I think I had one or two people contact me about it. Very good. Um, yeah, you guys got your, uh, got your points for that. Okay. Um, so, um, we're basically done. Uh, we've talked about how to capture um, uh, entities, relationships, unconstrained participation constraints. When you have a participation constraint of at most one and at and uh, exactly one, um, at least one. I'm telling you, you're, we can't capture that um, uh, in terms of a key constraint in the relation. You can easily do that uh, with an ER diagram. I mean, it's defined for an ER diagram. You know, here, um, at least one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, employees' departments, right? Um, an employee should work for at least one department, and a department should have at least one employee. That's a very natural condition to have with employees and departments, um, this, this concept. Trying to capture this in a relation using key constraints, not possible. Um, but there's, there's one other type of important constraint that I have to talk about. Uh, this is the um, uh, oh, what's the word? What's the word? It's like a weak uh, relation, I think they call it. A weak entity set. A weak entity. Okay. Here is a weak entity. What a weak entity is, is when the only reason for this entity existing is because of another entity existing. Okay, that's a weak entity. 
the only reason why anything might exist here is because something exists here. Um, here's, let me turn off my camera real quick. Here's an example. We'll stick with employees. That's a regular entity. They have a social security number, a name, and a parking lot. The social security number is unique. Now, here they're going to have a, a health insurance policy, okay? And that is going to cost some amount of money. And on this policy, you can have dependents. And dependents can have a name and an age. Okay. Um, here, this is going to be a dotted line. And this entity is going to be bold. As is um, this relationship. These are bold. Okay. Let me um, do this real quick. Okay. So, <clears throat> um, uh, just to be sure that everybody's on the same page with what these words mean. Um, let's say, uh, well, I'm an employee at Rutgers. Um, I get my health insurance through Rutgers. So Rutgers might have a database somewhere of, of their employees that would have my name, that would have which parking lots I'm allowed to park in, and it would have my social security number. Okay, that's some table. So far, that's stuff we've already talked about. Now, if I have, uh, because I have health insurance, um, that health insurance can extend to other members of my family. Um, uh, in this case, my uh, uh, my wife is on our health insurance, on my health insurance policy, because it's cheaper and better than, than hers. So she is considered a dependent on my health insurance policy. Or if we had children, which we don't, but if we had children, then our children could also have health insurance because of my health insurance. My health insurance gets, you know, can kind of umbrella over other people in my immediate family, my wife and children. Those are called dependents. Okay? Now, let's say, um, uh, my wife's name is Emily. So let me start doing this here. Um, okay. So the employee table is going to be nothing special. Okay. Stuff we've talked about, social security number, name, lot. Okay. For weak entities, it is always the case that these have to be in one table. Okay, so I'm going to call this the policy dependent table. Okay. Now, um, as relationships do, no matter what, like here's here's this relationship here. Um, all right, so an employee, I could have zero policies. That's okay. Maybe maybe I'm using my wife's uh, insurance policy, so I don't need an insurance policy. So having zero is okay. Um, having uh, one is obviously okay. <laughs> I should have health insurance, some policy, being an employee of Rutgers. Could I have two? Technically, I think I could. 
um, because not only am I an employee, but I'm also a PhD student. And so maybe if I wanted to, I could have the student health insurance and employee health insurance. I mean, if I, I don't think that there's anything legally barring me from having more than one insurance policy if I'm paying what I need to to have whatever policy it is. I, that's uncommon, but okay. So that, that, that's okay to be unconstrained. Okay, in any case, so here is this relationship, the policy that's connected to an employee. And so at the very least, it should have the key um, associated with that. Um, in addition, here on the left, um, or on the right, excuse me, um, this relationship also co is connected to this other entity that has a P name um, as, as its key. Um, now, it's not exactly a primary key. It's a little different. This is why it's sort of a dotted underline. But okay, let's 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 fill up the rest of this table. So um, the uh, thing also has a cost, and people have an age. Okay, so the social security number is a foreign key into the employee table, and here the social security number and the P name. This is a composite key. Okay. Uh, now, one thing that gets added to this is this is not null. Okay. Uh, this is basically it. How to capture this thing called a weak entity relationship. First of all, let me, let me go through again what a weak entity relationship is and why the dependent has a key, but not really quite a key. Um, let's say my, my, my wife's, I don't know, my social security number, um, I'll say it's, you know, 1111, Nathan. And I'm in lot three. So here I am, um, and I have a dependent named Emily. Um, and the cost of our insurance, um, it's great because I'm a PhD student and so, you know, they pay us like slave wages. But also, um, Rutgers is a very progressive in the fact that um, what you pay for your health insurance scales with what your salary is. So I get the exact same health insurance as anybody, uh, any employee of the university, um, but I pay like $20 a month. So actually it's more than that. It's like 45 or $50 a month. It used to be 20, but now that I'm married, it's more. I call it 45 a month. Um, and uh, my age, whatever. Oh, no, Emily, she's younger. She's 32. Okay, whatever. Uh, okay, so this P name, um, it should be okay that there's another employee. Um, John, who's also in parking lot three. Maybe John also has a wife named Emily. Um, he's a, a, a another professor. We have the same health insurance, but he's paying um, you know three hundred a month in, in health insurance. And uh, for his wife, it, she's thirty four. Whatever. Okay. So the weak entity part of this, when I say that the existence of one entity relies on the existence of another, is that if I'm not employed at Rutgers, then my wife has no business being a dependent on some health insurance policy through Rutgers. If I get fired, or if I quit, or if you know, if I if I leave the university somehow, then I leave 
and my name would get deleted from the employee database. And in addition to that, anybody who has a connection to me uh, through the insurance thing should also be deleted. So in this case, Emily, this record should also be deleted. Okay, um, so this is um, on delete cascade. Okay, what that means is if, if you delete me, it cascades and anything that I was connected to also gets deleted. All right, that's the idea of a weak entity. The sole reason for something's existence is reliant on something else. If that one thing goes away, then everything that it is connected to should also go away. That's on delete cascade. In addition to this, the social security number can't be null. You can't have, for example, null um, Josh. Wait, I have a question. Yes. Is a weak entity like a bad thing? Because technically, wouldn't this happen? Like, how else could you design it so there wouldn't be a weak entity? How else could you design it so it wouldn't be a weak entity? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm just I'm just asking like is a weak entity a bad thing or is it just like something that happens? No, no, no. Yeah, it's not it's, no, it's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. It's just the it's just the name of it. It's called weak um not because it's inferior um but because it's reliant on another entity. I don't know why they chose the name weak because it can't stand on its own. It's reliant on something else. So if the thing that it's reliant on goes away, then it goes away too. Um, it's not meant to be disparaging language in any in any way. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So the important things here are on delete cascade. This foreign key isn't just a foreign key, but when something deletes, that has a ripple effect. Um, for everything else that it's connected to with weak entities. Um, so that's that's one important thing, this, this part, the on-delete cascade. It's also important that this can't be null. Okay, Josh here, he can't exist as a dependent with, with a social security number being null. Um, because a null social security number means that there's no person who's providing the insurance policy that's claiming him as a dependent. Um, yeah, so this this would not this would not be allowed, this entry for weak entities. That is to say that this must be some non-null value. Some non-null value that also exists in the employee table. Um, yeah, because of the null. Um, what else? Oh, yeah, and the uh, the P name here. So the reason why this has the uh, dotted line is because the dependence table can have repeats. That's that's not a problem. Um, here earlier, um, when I still existed, um, uh, it should be okay that there's two dependents named Emily. Um, uh, and it's the combination of social security number and P name, both of those that uniquely define a dependent. So yes, there's multiple Emily's, but this Emily is associated with this social security number, my social security number, because that's my Emily. Um, uh, John, his Emily is a different Emily. And although they're both Emily, um, this Emily is glued to John's social security number, and my Emily is glued to my social security number. So, um, uh, and because that it has to be that way, they, they use this sort of underline, dotted underline, to show that it's not a key in the formal sense, it's going to be a deposit key. 
or a composite key, excuse me. It's going to be a composite key, this thing. So the, that's what the dotted underlined is. Okay. Oh boy, guys, I'm sorry. We're like, we're like five minutes over time. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, let's uh, be done for the day. Um, the uh, thing that's impossible, I'll, I'll upload it. Um, uh, I'll, I don't know, I'll draw it out or, or, or something, and you guys can play around with it later. Um, yeah, sorry for keeping you over time.